Welcome to the Trinity's Podcast, where we explore theories about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you love God enough to think about Him? Episode 358, Baptist Justice, Samuel Eddy on Scripture, Church Discipline, and the Trinity. Samuel Eddy was born in 1768 in Johnston, Rhode Island. He was a descendant of one of the original settlers at Plymouth in Massachusetts in 1630. He went to Rhode Island College, later renamed Brown University, where he excelled in his studies. In 1790, he served as a Rhode Island delegate on their state convention which ratified the new U.S. Constitution. They were the last state to do so, by the way. That same year, he began to practice as a lawyer and to serve as a clerk at the Rhode Island Superior Court, and in 1791, he earned his master's degree from the same college. Then, after some service in the Rhode Island State Assembly, he was appointed Secretary of State of Rhode Island in 1797, a position he held until 1819. Meanwhile, he must have gotten serious about his relationship with God, as in 1805 he was baptized and became a member of the First Baptist Church in Providence, Rhode Island. This congregation and its 1775 building are still there, by the way, in the heart of Providence. They now have rebranded themselves as the First Baptist Church in America, as they were founded in Providence by Roger Williams in 1638, after he was driven out of Puritan, Massachusetts in 1636. Back to Eddie, he was soon a prominent member at the First Baptist Church, and he served as one of their delegates to the Warren Association, a kind of denomination light for Baptist churches in New England, one consistent with the self-governance of its member churches. He tells us that, like others, he had just assumed that the doctrine of the Trinity is both true and taught in the Bible. Yes, he'd heard talk of Unitarians, but those aren't Christians, right? So who cares what they think? Who knows what their hang-up is? He tells us that what finally caused him to investigate these matters was faulty arguments he encountered on the Trinitarian side for the underived power and full deity of Christ. Not having read any Unitarian literature, he decided, like a good Protestant, that the answer to these debates must be in Scripture. So he went through the whole New Testament and wrote out every text that was relevant to the Father, the Son, and the Spirit of God. And this made him a Unitarian Christian. In his words, the result was a full conviction that the Father was the only true God, and that Christ was not the Father, that is, that being whom Christ asserts to be the only true God. At first, Eddie was not ready to go public, but he wanted to stir the pot. So in 1818, he published a 23-page tract called Scripture, Its Own Interpreter, in Relation to the Character of Christ, being a collection of scriptures explanatory of each other on that subject with preliminary observations. He did not put his own name on this, but used the pseudonym Textuarius. In this, he quotes many dozens of scriptures, pairing them so that some shed light on the other ones, and he makes some remarks about what it all shows. In short, it points towards Jesus being a man, not a God-man or a second person of the Trinity. According to one historical source, this tract created considerable discussion in theological circles. And I believe that before long, it was widely known that Eddie was the author. Evidently, someone at his church decided on a novel method to smoke out the heretics. At some point, church members were asked to sign a copy of some Trinitarian doxologies penned by the famous English hymn writer Isaac Watts. These would have said things like, To God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit, three in one, be honor, praise, and glory given by all on earth and all in heaven. Or, Honor to the Almighty Three and Everlasting One. All glory to the Father be, the Spirit and the Son. Or, glory to God the Trinity, whose name has mysteries unknown, in essence one, in persons three, a social nature yet alone. We don't exactly know how the conversation went, but Eddie did not sign and did not think they had the right to require him to sign. 
His first tract had been published in March of 1818. On the last day of that month, a leadership committee of the church met and informed Samuel Eddy that he would be required to state his theological views to them in writing at their next meeting, just a few days later on April 2nd. This Eddy did, reading and then leaving them with a copy of his short statement, which was almost entirely in the words of Scripture. He also protested their right on Baptist principles to discipline him for holding these views, seeing as how the church strongly asserted that its only creed is the Bible, and that it defends the conscience of the individual believer. This short statement, he says, did not fully satisfy the committee. Surprise, surprise. And so they demanded that he give a longer and clearer statement, which he eventually did on June 5, 1818. This is the statement you'll hear in the rest of this episode of the Trinity's podcast. It's a clearly and strongly argued classic, both as to biblical theology and Christology, and also as to what should be the conditions of Christian fellowship. He quite properly calls his Baptist brethren on the carpet for choosing post-biblical traditions over clear biblical teachings on these topics. But before I get to that, let me briefly tell you about the rest of Samuel Eddy's life. Eddy's Baptist church membership was revoked, but luckily there was a Unitarian Congregationalist church in Providence, and he became a member of that. Amazingly, it too is still there in Providence, Rhode Island, a beautiful building finished in 1816, though sadly it is no longer a Christian church, but has long been UU at this point. Eddie's second tract, containing the short, purely scriptural statement and the longer, more potently argued one that you're about to hear, was published at some point by the American Unitarian Association in Boston and later by other Unitarian organizations and went through many editions and printings as late as 1855. It has the rather clunky title, Reasons Offered by Samuel Eddy, LLD, Late Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Rhode Island, for his opinions to the First Baptist Church in Providence, from which he was compelled to withdraw for heterodoxy. This tract was so widely printed and read because of its quality, as you're about to hear. Samuel Eddy stopped serving as the Rhode Island Secretary of State in 1819, after he was elected to the United States Congress. He served there until 1825. In 1826, he became an associate justice on the Rhode Island Supreme Court, and in 1827, he became its chief justice. He served there until 1835. In his later years, he served in the leadership for Brown University and pursued scientific and historical interests. He was married four times, and in this time, I have to assume that this was because three of his wives died before him rather than because of divorce although I don't know for sure. He had at least one child who survived to adulthood, his daughter Anna Eddy, who lived from 1810 until 1881. Eddy died in 1839 at the age of 69, after which he was buried in Providence's North Burial Ground, where you can still see his gravestone. See the link on the blog post for this episode at trinities.org. Now, let's hear the longer part of Eddie's Reasons Offered tract, the part after his short confession in the words of Scripture. Now, since North American English has changed a lot since 1818, more than 200 years ago, I have modernized the language for you so that you'll easily understand it. The original featured hundreds of Scripture references. I don't say all of them here. So now, let's hear the voice of a studious and thoughtful Baptist who is consistently living out the Baptist commitment to Scripture in front of a hostile church committee on June 5, 1818. Brothers, the same reasons which induced me at the last meeting to state in writing my faith concerning God and Christ have also induced me to commit to writing the rest of what I have to say on this. Only two questions present themselves for your consideration. First, whether in the opinion of the church, my opinions are scriptural or not. Second, if they are not, whether for that cause alone, the church can, by the laws of Jesus Christ, or the principles on which this church was founded, discipline me. It is to be remembered that, 
It is only for my opinions that I am called into question. Duties to myself and to you require that I should state the origin of my doubts about the commonly received doctrine of the Trinity and the course of investigation I pursued. But before I state this, permit me to say that, to my great surprise, my opinions are represented by many as indicating a state of mind altogether indifferent as to my future welfare, and even as indicating doubts about a future state of rewards and punishments, a state rendered certain, in the opinion of some of the best and most learned people, from the very light of nature, independent of all revelation. Brothers, can you believe that life eternal life has all at once become of no value to me, and that for no other reason than to be exposed to hatred, slander, and harsh criticism, I have voluntarily departed from him who is the way, the truth, and the life? Do you think that my mind has become callous to the importance of wise judgment and the joys of salvation? Can you believe that I have willingly and without a cause incurred the loss not only of Christian fellowship, but private friendship? that I have suddenly ceased to care about all that is most dear to us, either in time or eternity? You must either believe this, or you must do me the justice to acknowledge that my opinions are the result of careful investigation and are declared under a serious sense of duty and a full persuasion of future responsibility. The common doctrine of the Trinity was received by me, as it is by most others, without examination. I had, as you probably have, taken it for granted without investigation to be the truth of revelation, and for a time that faith in it was necessary to being a Christian. I am happy, however, in saying that this was but a short time. And so strong was my prejudice on this subject that even though Unitarianism was frequently a subject of conversation, I never once gave that side of the question any attention. As far as I can recollect, False arguments presented in proof of the underived power and proper deity of Christ first turned my mind towards a consideration of this subject. As I read the scriptures, passages presented themselves in a light in which I had never before viewed them, and my doubts increased. As I had read nothing against the received doctrine, I was determined to satisfy my mind from the only correct source of information. Whatever the true doctrine might be, I was persuaded that it must appear in the New Testament. So, I focused on that. And that I might have the whole evidence on that subject in front of me at once, as far as possible, I transcribed every word from the beginning of Matthew to the end of Revelation, which appeared to me relevant to the question. The result was a full conviction that the Father was the only true God, and that Christ was not the Father, that is, that being whom Christ asserts to be the only true God. When the Trinity's podcast returns, Samuel Eddy challenges the Baptist Church Committee on their right to discipline him merely for having certain theological opinions. I now ask you to consider the question whether by the laws of Jesus Christ or the principles on which this church was founded, my opinions render me a subject of church discipline. In the first place, I assert that no example can be produced from the New Testament for disciplining a member for entertaining erroneous opinions. Neither is there any teaching which will warrant such discipline against one who acknowledges Jesus Christ to be the Son of God. All the cases recorded are for criminal conduct, not opinions. The scriptural ideas of schism and heresy have been too often explained to render it necessary for me to prove at this time that mere opinions constitute no part of the offenses expressed by these words. 
It is conduct, not faith, right or wrong, that makes people heretics and schismatics. A leader of a faction, a willful sower of discord in a church, is a heretic, however orthodox his opinions may be. But what faction have I formed? To whom or against whom have I set myself up as a leader? Into whose mind have I instilled or endeavored to instill my own views? What book have I recommended? To whom have I recommended any book on the subject before you? On these questions, I challenge investigation. And let those who are most eager to charge me with criminality for this reason take care lest, while they accuse me, they condemn themselves. To be the occasion of contention is no evidence of criminality, for one may be an innocent occasion. Indeed, Christ himself and all the apostles were the innocent occasions of contentions. If my opinions have occasioned discord in this church, they who have made the discord and not my opinions are blameworthy for that discord. I have no contention with anyone. For my opinions I am ready to answer and show that you have no authority over my opinions. Whose example gives a better rule of Christian fellowship than the examples of Christ and of his apostles? What was the conduct of Christ, and with whom did he associate in worship? Did he only associate with those who invoke Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and who acknowledge three persons in one God, and each of these persons true God? Certainly not, for no such worshippers were then to be found on the face of the earth. Rather, he constantly united with those who worshipped the one living and true God, the God of Israel. He did this in the synagogues, taking an active part. This was his custom. But it may be objected that Jesus was a Jew, a minister of the circumcision, made under the law, who came to fulfill it. So be it. But he was a worshiper of the one living and true God, not in two or three persons, but one. And he had fellowship with those who worshipped this one living and true God. It is his steps we are commanded to follow. But it may be replied, the Christian dispensation was not then fully begun. The apostles had not then received their commission, nor had they been given power from on high. Let us then examine the apostles' conduct and see if on this subject it differed from that of their master. And with whom were they in the practice of uniting in worship? With the Jews, just as regularly as their master, with both Sadducees and Pharisees, in the temple and in the synagogues. It may be objected that they were not there to worship, but to preach the gospel. But this is untrue. What did Jesus say foretelling their persecution? In John 16, 2, he says, They, that is, the Jews, shall put you out of, that is, exclude you from, the synagogues. And would that have been persecution had it been unlawful to enter in and worship with the Jews? On the principles I am opposing, he ought to have said, Don't go into the synagogues, nor have fellowship with those who worship in them, for they are all, and in this he would have said truly, anti-Trinitarians and deniers of my deity. And what did Paul say to the Jews of Ephesus? I must by all means keep the approaching festival in Jerusalem. What did he say in his defense before Felix? It is not more than twelve days since I went up to worship in Jerusalem. Of course he means in the temple, to which Peter and John went, it says, at the hour of prayer, and to which in Solomon's porch the apostles and brothers and sisters gathered to worship the same temple in which Paul, in the very act of worship, was seized as a heretic. But it may be objected that these precedents aren't relevant to the case before us, and that the question now is whether, in a Christian church, we are to have fellowship with those whose opinions, in our opinion, are unscriptural. This would, in fact, be making the question whether we are to be wiser than the apostles, more shrewd than they in detecting and more scrupulous in rejecting 
unfitness for Christian fellowship. Those who maintain the affirmative would have no fellowship with those who deny the position that there are three persons in one God, and each of these persons true God. A position not stated anywhere in the Bible, and which cannot be plausibly stated in the words of Scripture. But would these people have fellowship with ones who deny the resurrection of the dead, or with those who lack the knowledge of God? Yet, we read that in the church of God at Corinth, among those called to be saints, of whom Paul says, But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and in the Spirit of our God, we are sure, from the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, were persons destitute of belief in resurrection and, Paul says, of the knowledge of God. And what directions did Paul give in this case? Did he say, cast them out, deliver them over to the torments of Satan? No, Paul said no such thing. He had not learned this from Christ. Instead, when he declared to them their errors, he said, I say this to your shame. Sober up as you rightly ought to and sin no more. The clear implication from these facts is that Christ and his apostles had fellowship in worship with all who worship the one living and true God. And we have the evidence of teaching and example that the only requirement for admission into the church was repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, or in other words, confession that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That a uniformity of faith should be required, or supposed possible to exist in a church, is repugnant to reason as well as scripture. Understanding the various and conflicting opinions of Christians requires much reading and reflection, as well as powers of discernment. Not everyone has these. What it takes to be informed, these things are not within the reach of everyone, and of those who have them, All are not endowed with the same capacities for investigation, nor with the same love of truth, nor with equal diligence in the pursuit of it. In all these respects, people differ, and the inevitable consequence is differences of opinion. A whole church may declare their faith in certain propositions, and thus may be said to be of one faith. But the question is, after all, Do they all believe the same truths or hold the same opinions for truths? Probably nearly everyone in this church, if asked, do you believe in the doctrine of the Trinity, would answer, yes. But if asked separately and apart, what do you mean by the Trinity? No two would give the same answer, nor would any two understand the same supposed truths by the word Trinity. How then can they be said to be of one faith on this subject. What greater mockery of seriousness and truth can be imagined than to ask an illiterate person or any other equally uninformed person on presenting himself to a church for admission, whether he believes in a trinity in unity or a triune God, as some call it, or original sin and the other of the five points of Calvinism as they are usually termed. And yet, this mockery is actually made of seriousness and truth by all who require members on admission into a church to subscribe to certain articles of faith. Such members may assent to the articles and profess to believe them, but do they believe the truths which the articles are supposed to express? Certainly no more than if they were expressed in Latin or Greek unless they understand the meaning of the words contained in these creeds. I am happy to learn, however, that many of our churches have become ashamed of their statement of faith and prudently keep it out of sight. To the honor of the founders of this church and to the founders of every Baptist church in the state of Rhode Island, uncolored with the distinctive theories of Calvin, they, as far as I can learn, cast no such contempt on seriousness and common sense. Not any of them had any covenant or creed other than the scriptures. They knew that we must differ and would differ and had a right to differ in opinion 
and that though at one time we might all agree, it was no guarantee of future agreement. This difference of opinion has existed and now exists in the members of this church, and that without any lack of charity, on points of as much importance in the opinion of many as those now in question. To suppose a constant uniformity of beliefs in a church is to suppose that each member is miraculously and instantaneously brought to the knowledge of the whole truth, and that forever after they are to remain stationary, never advancing in knowledge. I cannot sufficiently express my contempt for a person who has what it takes to be informed within their reach, and yet neither hopes nor desires nor uses these things to know more tomorrow than they knew yesterday. Such may well be content with creeds and shackles and handcuffs. They are not in danger of being convinced tomorrow that they were in error yesterday. Others, however, know that an increase of knowledge renders it possible, at least, to produce a conviction of error in past opinions. They know it from experience as well as the commands of reason. They know also that the commission given by Christ to the apostles to preach the gospel presupposes an increase of knowledge after conversion and an ability of the teacher to communicate that knowledge. The order of the Great Commission in Matthew 28 is to first convert, then to baptize, and then to teach. To the shame of many teachers and churches, this order is completely reversed. They act as if it says when making converts to first teach them the creed, and if they say it right, then baptize and receive them into the church, otherwise not. But this is not the wisdom of Jesus, but rather the overturning of his authority. This reasoning is fully confirmed by the Apostle Paul in his letters to the Romans and to the Philippians. In the former, especially when he says, Who are you to judge another man's, that is, Christ's, servant? To their own master servants stand or fall. Romans 14.4 This clearly implies that one who has confessed Christ and thereby become his servant is answerable at no other tribunal unless he should revolt from the service of his master. Also, when Paul says, the kingdom or reign of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit, because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and receives human approval, Romans 14, 18, what overconfidence in their own knowledge and holiness must they have who would reject someone who is pleasing to God and receives human approval? We should remember that Paul doesn't say here that whoever believes this creed or that creed, but rather whoever serves Christ. And until it is shown that those with views like mine cannot serve Christ, I ask by what authority will you reject that teaching of Paul in Romans 15, which says, Welcome one another, therefore, just as Christ has welcomed you to the glory of God. The same writer informs us that circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing, but obeying the commandments of God is everything. 1 Corinthians 7.19 I have not yet been told that I am less capable of this service than my brothers and sisters. When the Trinity's podcast returns, Samuel Eddy presses on an important weakness in the Trinitarian's case, the Holy Spirit. I will now argue that, however unscriptural my opinions may be in the view of this church, 
they are such as an honest person may consider without being accused of ignorance or irreligion, and that so far from demanding immediate condemnation, they deserve an impartial and serious investigation. First, however, as the present difficulty began with my objecting to the signing of Isaac Watts's doxologies to the Trinity, permit me to make a few remarks on that subject. It has been the boast of this church that it has no other creed but the Scriptures, and that it adopts no practice unless it is warranted by apostolic example or authority. The language of our pastor has been, Unless you can produce a thus saith the Lord for your practice, reject it. In vain have I inquired for any scriptural teaching or precedent for signing a doxology to the Trinity. None has even been claimed. Whether there is a Trinity or not, it must be admitted that we have no more authority for this practice than for any of those of the Roman Catholic Church. More than this, it is admitted that there is no authority, unless the Council of Constantinople and the official statements of church officials count as an authority, for offering prayer, praise, or thanksgiving to the Holy Spirit, either as a distinct person or in union with the other supposed persons of the Trinity. But the evidence in this case is not all negative. We have two positive teachings giving explicit directions in this case and in direct opposition to the practice of this church and of every other church which is in the practice of singing doxologies to the Trinity. In his letter to the Ephesians, the Apostle Paul thus expresses himself, Be filled with the Spirit as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to one another, singing and making melody to the Lord in your hearts, giving thanks to God the Father at all times and for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians 5.18-20 Here is a rule for the direction of Christians in giving praise to God. It is to God the Father in the name of Jesus Christ. Not, as is our practice, to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in the name of nobody. The same teaching is given about the same subject in nearly the same words in Colossians 3, 16 and 17, and in Hebrews 13, 15. Indeed, a teaching of our practice must, I think, appear strange to an unprejudiced reader of the Bible. Did God select the Jews as a people to preserve the knowledge of the one true God? And does this one true God consist of three persons, one of whom is called the Holy Spirit? And did God never clearly reveal this truth to them? Did he commission Jesus Christ to testify to the truth, John 18, 37, and to bring life and immortality to light? 2 Timothy 1.10, and has he declared that this life, eternal life, consists in the knowledge of the Father, the only true God, and himself? John 17.3, and is there a person in the divine nature called the Holy Spirit who forms an essential part of the deity equal with the Father in all respects? And has Christ given no hint of this? And if he has not, and if this doctrine is true, Has Christ not failed in the execution of his commission? Indeed, if it's true, has he not denied the truth by asserting that the Father, called by Trinitarians the first person of the Trinity, is the only true God? That neither Christ nor his forerunner John the Baptist taught this doctrine can be inferred from other considerations. The case of the twelve baptized by Paul at Ephesus in Acts 19 proves that they had heard no such doctrine. Yet, they were disciples, believers in Jesus. But when questioned whether they had received the Holy Spirit since they believed, they declared that they had not so much as heard whether there was any Holy Spirit. Is it possible that this could have been the case had they been taught that there was a person in the divine nature called the Holy Spirit equal with the Father, and equally with him an object of worship, of praise, and thanksgiving? John told his disciples, 
when he baptized them, that he baptized them in water, but that he that should come after him would baptize them in the Holy Spirit. Matthew 3.11 That this did not imply a person called the Holy Spirit is clear from the case of these twelve in Acts 19.3. Further, what Jew would have been baptized into the belief of a triune God? This they had not been taught to be the God of their fathers. That this doctrine was not taught by the apostles is further evident from the declarations of Paul before Felix in Acts 24. According to the way which they call a sect, I worship the God of my fathers. And from the charge of the Jews against him before Gallio in Acts 18, that Paul had persuaded people to worship God in ways that are contrary to the law. Not that he worshipped any but him whom they considered the true God. Nowhere is he or the other apostles or Christ or the disciples charged with worshipping the Holy Spirit or any other than him whom the Jews believed to be the true God. But when have the Jews acknowledged a triune God, or a dual God, or a person, or subsistence, or being called the Holy Spirit as an object of worship or praise? On the whole, it is quite clear to me that praises offered to God as a trinity of persons are not only not warranted by Scripture, but are a direct violation of clear teaching and are something which no Jew would have submitted to and something that neither Christ nor the apostles could, with safety to themselves, have either taught or practiced. Let it not be inferred that this is a denial of spiritual gifts or influences. God is a spirit. He is omnipotent. He is everywhere and can affect his creatures and carry out his purposes without the intervention of a supposed third person or of any agents whatever. When the Trinity's podcast returns, Samuel Eddy explains why, in his view, New Testament theology is Unitarian and not Trinitarian. I will now, in as few words as possible, state the grounds of my belief that there is only one self-existent and true God, and that Jesus Christ is not that being. I know no better source of information on this subject than the one who is commissioned by the Father to testify to the truth, and was taught by Him what He should say and what He should speak. In addressing the Father in prayer, Christ says, This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Trinitarians assert that God consists of three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But Christ here asserts, in languages plain and unequivocal as can be devised, that the Father is the only true God, saying nothing of the Holy Spirit, and clearly distinguishing the Father from himself. I don't know how words can be more clear. This Father he declares to be Lord of heaven and earth, to be his God and his Father, and addresses him as such. In his conversation with the scribe in Mark 12, he asserts that the Lord our God is one, and approves of the scribe's reply, who said, He is one, and besides him there is no other. Nowhere can I learn that Christ ever made any claim to be the self-existent God, or to be possessed of underived power. On the contrary, he repeatedly asserts that of himself he could do nothing, and that the Father who dwelled in him did the works. Once he was charged with making himself equal with God, and once with making himself God, And in both instances, he refuted the charge. 
the first time because he said that God was his own father. To this he immediately replied that the son can do nothing on his own, but only what he sees the father doing. And directly after, I can do nothing on my own. If at this time he could, on his own, either as God or man, have done anything, can he be acquitted of the charge of deceit? The second time he was falsely accused because he had said, The Father and I are one, from which declaration the Jews inferred that he was making himself God. But he shows them that by this declaration he only made himself the Son of God and immediately proves to them that by calling himself the Son of God, he had assumed a lower title than God himself had given to their rulers. For he called them gods. It says, Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said, you are gods? Quoting the 82nd Psalm, in which God addressed the Jewish rulers. If those to whom the word of God came were called gods, Jesus continued, and the scripture cannot be annulled or contradicted, can you say that the one whom the Father has sanctified and sent into the world is blaspheming because I said, I am God's Son? How can words be more understandable than these? On another occasion, Jesus shows, to use the language of the learned Dr. Campbell, the infinite disparity between himself and the great God. When charged with casting out demons by Beelzebul, he says, Whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven. Matthew 12.32 Where then is the supposed equality between the Father and the Son? And why forgiveness in the one case and not in the other, if the dignities of both are equal? In another instance, when addressed by the title, Good Teacher, he immediately replies, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. Does he not clearly distinguish himself from the great fountain of original and underived goodness? Thus, in Revelation 15, 3 and 4, those who sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, a song not in honor of Moses or the Lamb, but rather the Lord God Almighty, are represented as saying, Great and amazing are your deeds, Lord God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the nations. Lord, who will not fear and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you. My rule in the investigation of this subject has been to understand passages of a doubtful meaning by those which are clear and unequivocal, and to consider Christ's declarations about himself as most important. I know that to the repeated declarations of Christ of his limited power and knowledge and of his dependence on the Father for help, it will be answered that Christ had two natures, and that in these cases he spoke of himself in the human nature. But as neither Christ nor the apostles have given any indications of this, and as it is, in my opinion, utterly impossible to reconcile such a supposition with the honesty and freedom from deceit we all attribute to Christ, I am bound to reject this speculation. I will now consider the words of the apostles. Paul in 1 Corinthians 8 says that there is no God but one though there may be so-called gods. Yet for us, there is one God, the Father, and one Lord, Jesus Christ. He says also in Ephesians 4 that there is one Lord and one God and Father of all, and that the latter is above all and through all and in all. Paul also says that the Father is the God of our Lord Jesus Christ that he is the head of Christ, that Christ is God's, that Christ, since the ascension, lives to God, and that he also lives by the power of God, which Christ also says about himself. He also says that at the resurrection, Christ shall deliver up his kingdom to the Father, and that the Son himself will also be subjected 
to the one, that is the Father, who put all things in subjection under him, so that God may be all in all. 1 Corinthians 15.28 He also says about God, in distinction from the Lord Jesus Christ, that he is the only sovereign, and that it is he alone who has immortality. 1 Timothy 6.15 and 16 Jude 4 also plainly distinguishes between the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul also says to the Romans, 1, 19 and 20, that what can be known about God, even his eternal power and divine nature, are manifest from the works of creation. But who will pretend to say that these works show the existence of God in three persons? And if they do not, he either does not exist in three persons, or the declaration of the apostle cannot be true. These passages are all clear, understandable even by the least intelligent, and there can be no disputes about their meaning. When the Trinity's podcast returns, doesn't Paul also say that Jesus is God and that he's as divine as the Father? But it may be objected that, despite all this, Paul has asserted that Christ is God and equal with God the Father. Is it believable that a man of intelligence, never mind divine inspiration, will assert things contradictory to each other? And if Paul has asserted that Christ is God, equal with the Father, has he not contradicted himself? And has he not by necessary implication asserted that there are two gods? Doesn't such equality necessarily imply plurality? But Paul has made no such assertions. The passages referred to are Romans 9.5, Philippians 2.6, and Hebrews 1.8-9. About the meaning of which Trinitarians have differed among themselves, as well as with others, and for no other reason but because the passages allow for different interpretations. And it ought not to be forgotten that our King James translation was made by Trinitarians. As to Romans 9.5, the words admit of this translation as well as the one in our King James Version. God who is over all, be blessed forever. As to the other two, Philippians 2 and Hebrews 1, as well as passages in Colossians and Ephesians which speak of Christ's creating all things, The context in each passage plainly shows his inferiority and derived power. That the creation there spoken of cannot be the material world and heavens is evident because it is again and again asserted that the Father was the creator of these. And the Father and the Son could not each have been the creator of the same things. The creation, therefore, spoken of in these passages must be other than the material world unless it's understood that it was the Father who was in the Son who created all things, and to this interpretation I have no objections. It should also be remembered that although Christ is called God, yet the Father is still called His God. But who is the God of the Father? Nowhere is it said that the Father has a God. It's also said of John that even though he recorded the words of Christ in John 17, that the Father is the only true God, nonetheless he has asserted in his first letter, chapter 5, that the Son is the true God. Can both claims be true? Can the Father be the only true God and the Son the true God? Can any two claims be more contradictory? but the Apostle has asserted no such contradiction. The latter passage is a beautiful illustration and confirmation of the first. John asserts that they knew that the Son of God had come, 
that he had given them an understanding that they might know the true God, the very thing which Christ said was necessary to eternal life, that they were under the true God by being under his Son, Jesus Christ, and that this was the true God and the eternal life which God had promised to them who knew him, evidently alluding to the words of Christ in John 17. The passages which speak of Christ as being the firstborn, the only Son, the Son of God, the beginning of the creation of God, the image of God, the gift of God, made Lord in Christ, that he had to become like his brothers and sisters, that he was exalted to be a leader and savior, made head over all things to the church, possessing the fullness of God because it pleased God, appointed heir of all things, ordained the judge of the world, made for a little while lower than the angels, made better than the angels, given a name which is above every name, and even the name Christ, all show derived existence and power, just as much as those which speak of God clearly distinguished from Christ as the only Lord God, the only sovereign, and the one who alone has immortality. John says that this is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son, and that no one who denies the Son has the Father. I can't fathom how it can be said that the Son is equal with the Father, that he is co-eternal with the Father, and self-existent without denying both Father and Son. Nor can I understand wherein the relationship of Father and Son, in any sense, can exist or be supposed to exist, consistent with this hypothesis. For my part, I dare not deny that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, nor would I dare to claim anything inconsistent with that truth. Again, it's said that Christ is the God-man, mediator between God and us. But why mediate for that which he himself can bestow? If Christ is omnipotent, capable of bestowing all blessings and forgiving all sins, why mediate or intercede for the same forgiveness and the same blessings? Why direct us to pray to the Father in his name? John 15, 16. And if, as the creed says, he is true God, with whom is he mediating but himself? And can God mediate for himself? Is not equality of the Son with the Father, each being true God, incompatible with one of them having the office of mediator? And does not such supposition involve an obvious absurdity? I would say, most certainly. Neither are we warranted by the Scriptures in believing that our mediator is true God. On the contrary, we are explicitly told in 1 Timothy 2.5, in so many words, that the one mediator between God and us is the man, Christ Jesus. Again, it is said by Trinitarians that the Son, the Word of the Father, took on human nature in the womb of the Virgin, and that two whole and perfect natures, the divine nature and the human nature, were joined in one person, never to be divided, so that there is one Christ, true God and true man, and that this is the Christ who is crucified for us. Yet we are explicitly told by the scriptures that Christ performed his miracles by the help of God, that the grace of God was with him. He himself says that he cast out demons by the Spirit of God, by the finger of God, that the Father who dwelled in him did the works. Christ prayed to him again and again for help, and to no one but him. I've never heard a plausible reason given for why he should pray if he were himself true God, nor why he needed the grace of God, nor why the Spirit of God should be given to him. Nor have I heard any explanation why he always prayed to the Father and directed his disciples to pray in the same way if there was a person in the divine nature equal with the Father called the Holy Spirit. Nor do I expect to hear any reason given, nor do I believe that any reason can be given. 
These are a summary of the reasons which have persuaded me to reject, which I do with a strong conviction of its falsity, the received doctrine of the Trinity, and to hold the Father to be the only true God. But while I do this, I by no means reject Christ, the Son of God, that he spoke as no one else ever spoke, that he was uniquely the Son of God, that God was in him, reconciling the world to himself, that he is a leader and a savior, that he is head over all things to the church, that the Father has given all judgment to him, that he is ordained by God as the judge of the living and the dead and will finally judge the world, I fully believe. That the same mind may be in you and me that was in him, that we may be guided by the same spirit of love and patience that was manifested in him, and that all our actions and motives may be such as to meet with his approval, is my sincere prayer. Samuel Eddy This week's thinking music has been the track Blue Notation by Ezra Skull. As always, there's a link on the blog post for this episode at trinities.org where you can listen to or download that entire track. Also, be sure to check out the blog post for a list of all the scriptures referred to in this episode, as well as some relevant links. for listening. We'll see you online at trinities.org. Till next time, don't forget to love God with all your mind.